We as humans have a limitless capacity for achievement, especially me. We've spread our civilizations across the globe. We've created vaccines against countless diseases. We've traveled into space and into the depths of the ocean. We are so immensely intelligent and capable. But when it comes to something as insignificant as a bit of anxiety or stress, it is unfathomable how poorly we deal with those feelings. I mean, it is nothing short of spectacular just how stupid we can act when clouded by a dose of anger or fear or any other negative emotion. There's always some sort of respect given to people who can control their emotions well. Those who can deal with stressful situations while maintaining a calm demeanor despite how chaotic they might feel within. Those who can deal with feelings of pain and grief and sorrow and continue living their lives normally alongside them. Those who feel tired and overwhelmed but who push on regardless seemingly unaffected. You see this all the time in the people you admire, and yet when it comes to yourself, it's always much more difficult to emulate than you anticipate. Sometimes you just feel terrible for no reason, and don't want to do anything, and it seems like there's nothing you can do about it. In psychology, there's a state known as learned helplessness. A certain study that discovered its effects is one of questionable ethics in which they administered electric shocks to two groups of dogs. One of those groups had no way of stopping the shocks, while dogs in the other group had a lever they could pull or some other action they could take to stop from feeling them. After a certain amount of shocks, dogs from both groups were given a new method that would stop the shocks, but dogs in the first group did nothing to try and stop them, while dogs in the second group quickly discovered the method and ended the shocks. The dogs in the first group had learned that they were helpless, and thus came to accept the shocks, assuming there to be no way of ending them, even when there was an action they could take to do so. The dogs from the first group had to literally be forced multiple times into flipping the switch that would end the shocks before they would become normal again. And this state can be applied to people experiencing negative emotions as well. In another study, teens were asked, do you have control over your emotions? and 40% answered that they didn't. So every one of them that said they couldn't control their emotions likely is of the mind that they're helpless against whatever emotions they come up against and are not going to do anything to try and manage them. But for you, just knowing this should be enough for you to always look for an opportunity to improve your situation. In this case, there are many psychologically proven ways of dealing with the negative emotions. None of them can reduce the amount of negative emotions you experience they simply reduce the amount of control those emotions have on you, which should be the goal anyways. An unfeeling mind is unrealistic. Instead, you should aim to improve the quality of the thoughts you have in response to your feelings. First of all, many people when struggling with emotions aren't even able to accurately identify what it is that they're feeling. You can't deal with something effectively unless you understand it. I think it can be very helpful to just think and articulate to yourself what specifically you're upset about and why, rather than simply admitting you feel bad right now. Identify the feeling, rate its intensity from 1 to 10, even assign it a color and a shape to visualize it, whatever. It's also important to find the source. Multiple studies outline that if you impose a stressor on a group of individuals involuntarily, and a separate group decides by their own volition to undergo that same exact stressor, the people who decided on their own use an entirely different psychophysiological system to deal with it. They use the system that's associated with approaching a challenge rather than the system that's associated with defensiveness and fear. It's even more apparent if you know you have control over the stressor. There was a study with adults who were assigned to complete a certain cognitive task, while every once in a while they'd be distracted by a loud noise. Some of them had no control over the noise, but others were given a button that could turn the noise off if they wanted to. The adults who were given a choice to turn the noise off, but who kept it on regardless, performed better than the adults who were forced to endure the same noise. Just the knowledge that the discomfort was something they had chosen improved their abilities, despite encountering the exact same obstacle as those who had no way of stopping the noise and who'd learned they were helpless. So, in finding the source of your emotions, you can begin to reason why it might be helpful to experience them. If you remind yourself that you decided to do whatever it is that is causing you stress, and that you always have the option to either give up or endure it, 
you will be much better at handling it. Stress itself is not unhealthy. In moderate amounts is considered youth stress and is deemed beneficial due to the growth it allows. Only excessively prolonged stress can be harmful. But that can be minimized as well through something called ACT. Not the American College Test, but rather Acceptance Commitment Therapy, which is a method of dealing with negative emotions and thoughts by accepting them and focusing on controlling one's behavior rather than one's feelings. Something Thomas Shelby said is, I can be scared and carry on. Think of an unwanted feeling like a really annoying roommate. They will be sitting there, but you can still do the things you want. Sometimes you might have four or five of these bothersome creatures. Some days you'll have none. Learn to coexist with them and don't let them ruin your day when they do appear. I've never had a roommate before for more than two weeks, so maybe this isn't the best analogy. But a really big part of ACT and accepting your emotions while not letting them dictate your behavior is creating psychological distance between yourself and your emotions. There's a well-known phenomenon in psychology called Solomon's Paradox, which entails that you are able to give much better advice to others than you can to yourself. A friend comes over to me with an issue that they're just unable to deal with, that's been driving them crazy for a while. They pose the problem to me, and then I can quickly and easily give them a good answer that seems pretty simple. It's not because I'm more intelligent, though you would be forgiven for thinking that. It's because it's easier to solve problems and make rational decisions about emotional situations that don't affect you, which is why we are infinitely better at helping other people than we are at helping ourselves. Thus, creating psychological distance between your thoughts and your feelings is a good way of decreasing the effect emotions will have on your decisions and improving the quality of those decisions. This psychological distance can be created through something called self-talk. All of us have an inner voice. You use it to repeat lists or numbers or names in your head over and over, and then forget them anyways. You use it to simulate conversations as if you're going to speak to anyone. You also use it to talk to yourself about how you feel and what you should do. But there are particular ways you can take advantage of the language you use to talk to yourself, which influences psychological distance. A good example is using your name or non-first person pronouns like him or you to talk to yourself when thinking. You can see the greatest basketball player of all time, LeBron James. Fine, one of the greatest basketball players of all time. You can see him do this when he had to make one of the biggest decisions of his life in 2010 after his contract with the Cleveland Cavaliers had come to an end and he became a free agent. He had to decide between staying with the Cavs or moving to either the Miami Heat, the New York Knicks, or the Chicago Bulls. Now, in an interview where LeBron explains his decision to go to the Heat, he says, I wanted to do the best for LeBron James and do what LeBron James was going to do to make him happy. By using non-first person pronouns and names, normally intended to refer to others to refer to ourselves instead, we can begin to think of ourselves and our problems as someone else's. And we are no longer as emotionally attached since we care about ourselves way more than we would care about someone else, and thus are able to make much better decisions. In a study by the University of Michigan, researchers designed an experiment to induce stress to undergrads in the most powerful way they could imagine. Public speaking. They told the undergrad students to give a speech on why they were qualified to land their dream jobs, what strengths they had, what they believed made them a good candidate, and to back those up with real life experiences and examples of how they've overcome adversity in the past. I know, this experiment is almost more unethical than the dogs. Now, they were given five minutes to prepare with no pen or pencil, and after they were all given three minutes to work through their stress, but half were instructed to do so in the first person, and half were instructed to do so not in the first person. So, some were instructed to think, why am I feeling this way? And others would think, why is Lucas feeling this way? Then they gave the presentations, and judges rated them on a scale of 1 to 5 based on confidence and persuasiveness and overall performance. <laughs> What's funny is that the audience members were specifically instructed to look stern and disapproving of the speaker, which is just cruel. 
Still, on average, participants in the non-first person group did significantly better than participants in the first person group. They were also asked after their speeches about how much shame they felt, and consistent with the former findings, on average the non-first person group reported feeling less shame about their speeches than the first person group. Finally, they were left alone after filling out some evaluations of how they felt, giving them some time to reflect on their performance and ruminate on their emotions, which, if you've just messed up a speech, is not a very fun thing to do. Then they're asked to describe in writing what they thought about during that time, which were then taken and scanned by computer programs to determine the amount of negative brooding and rumination those participants went through. And once again, first-person participants ruminated and dwelled on how they gave their speech more than non-first-person participants. So, what are the linguistic shifts doing that caused this change in performance? Another study that asked participants to actively think about an event that makes them feel stress, like a job interview, a meeting with your mother-in-law, or giving a public speech, and assigned some people to write about their feelings in first person and others to write in third person. Based on a challenge threat appraisal score determined by computer programs, non-first person participants on average scored higher than first person participants, meaning they were less likely to threaten themselves and more likely to be encouraging. Thinking about your problems as if you were thinking about someone else's problems instead forces you not to be so brutally unhelpful because you also treat others much more politely than you treat yourself. Which is understandable, have you met yourself? So by creating psychological distance, by referring to yourself in the third person, you're much better at reacting to negative emotions and thus perform and make decisions mo much more effectively. What's also kind of cool is that something else that's been found is that when you think of your emotions in a second language, you think of them in a more objective way. The small extra of effort you have to put in to form sentences in that second language about how you're feeling provides an extra psychological distance, allowing you to think through your issues more rationally. Regardless, all of this is to help you distance yourself from your emotions so that when you are experiencing them, either briefly or for extended periods of time, they do not control how you act and you are still able to effectively do whatever it is you need to do. Pro baseball player Yogi Berra illustrates exactly this when he said, Slump? I know, slump. I'm just not hitting. If you feel afraid for no reason, you can still act courageously. If you feel tired, you can still work hard. No matter how utterly worthless you feel, you can still live well. Except for you, Henry. Know that your feelings are temporary and will pass. As long as you read books, exercise, dress well, smile, and think about your life every once in a while, you're good. Other things will come naturally with time. Just make sure your train is on the right track and it's headed towards success. Then slowdowns and bumps won't matter as long as you keep moving forward. Something else Thomas Shelby said is that when you plan something, there's no need to rush. If you need to, just repeat to yourself onward then you should be able to keep on through any negative emotional state that washes over you regardless of intensity. But what about depression? For a while, I tried learning as much as I could about the biological and psychological aspects of depression in as little time as possible, and I came to the conclusion that I have absolutely no authority to give advice to other people on this subject. I can, however, share my thoughts on some things I learned which I found cool, and have you draw your own conclusions. So, is it biochemical or psychological? How much control do you have over it? What even is it? We can start with a definition. According to Robert Sapolsky, depression is a biochemical disorder with a genetic component and early experience influences where somebody can't appreciate sunsets. It's characterized by a couple symptoms. Inability to feel pleasure or anhedonia, grief and guilt, as well as psychomotor retardation, or the lack of motivation to do anything. Now, this refers to major depressions, where your prefrontal cortex is essentially whispering to the rest of your brain that the minor inconvenience that upset you emotionally this morning is equivalent to you experiencing massive amounts of physical pain, and so your body reacts accordingly for the next month. Thus, it's biochemical. And Sapolsky goes as far as to argue that it's as genetic a disorder as childhood diabetes, 
You don't say to someone with diabetes that they should just get over it. And this is what a lot of people think, that it is my body's chemistry, so I can't do anything about that. However, in the vast majority of cases, I don't believe people who think themselves to be experiencing a major depression have as little control as they believe themselves to have. According to Joan Hari, there are nine different causes of depression and anxiety, most of which are not biological, but are instead are lifestyle factors. But that doesn't make sense. We are a generation living better than Louis XIV, and yet we are more depressed than ever. What's up with that? Now, in the 1960s, women would go to their doctor and report that they had everything that a woman could possibly want. A husband, car, washing machine, two kids, but they still felt terrible. The doctor would say there's something wrong with your nerves and prescribe a Valium. We know now that these women had everything the culture told them they could possibly want, but that culture was terribly inaccurate. As a woman, as a human, you need more than just a washing machine and kids. You need a fulfilling life, you need a sense of purpose, you need a confident man with a big heart. Our situation now is not very different. People who have everything that they think they could ever want are still feeling like garbage. And we assume that's due to a natural chemical imbalance, but what if it's because they have a terrible idea of what it is they actually want? We've been given an inaccurate list of what things make us happy, and when we feel terrible, we automatically think there's something wrong with us, instead of something might be wrong with that list. Okay, but there is biochemistry involved, and depression is highly genetic. If you have an identical twin who has depression, you have a 50% chance of developing it as well. It's been found that a certain gene relating to serotonin levels in the brain is the source of this. It has a good version and a bad version. Now, in most cases, having either version does not increase or decrease your predisposed chance of having depression. Unless you are exposed early, to, early in adolescence to an immense amount of major stressors and you have the bad version of the gene, in which case you are much more likely to experience depression. Even in this case, however, depression is not 100% out of your control. I don't think anyone argues against that. There's always something you can do. You can have a mental health issue, but it is false to expect that others will slow down for you because you have it. In third world countries where people have far more to worry about in terms of survival, despair is a luxury. Even if, for some people, there wasn't anything they could do about it, which would you rather believe? That you have no influence whatsoever, or that it is something which you have control over? It might not be your fault, but it's your choice whether or not to take responsibility. It's tough when deciding whether or not to accept something as unchangeable or to struggle endlessly against it. When it comes to psychological issues, however, I think there's typically much more we can change than we think.